Good afternoon and welcome. I would like to take time to acknowledge that the UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated in the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Thank you for joining us today. This is our fourth hybrid meeting in the Catalyst program. Uh, just before we get going, uh, some housekeeping. The first half of this meeting will be a presentation by our speaker, whom I will introduce in a moment, and we will follow that with question and answer. Those of you in the audience, uh, raise your hands and you can ask your question directly. Um, those of you on Zoom, please put out your questions in the question and answer box, and I will ask your questions of the speaker. If there are any technical problems, please write that into the chat box in your Zoom app. So it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, David Wilkinson. He's a professor of biological and chemical engineering at UBC. He works in the details of decarbonization, energy conversation and storage, advanced sustainable solutions for energy and water use. He has many honors. They include Order of Canada, Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, Canada Research Chair, and a number of highly cited researcher awards. He is fundamentally a scientist and an engineer his specialty in science is electrochemistry, which he applies to energy solutions. All of you will understand that we mean batteries and where we're gonna store our energy. So David, his talk is Future Energy, How Climate Change, Sustainability, and Geopolitical Stability is Transforming the Path Forward. David Wilkinson, thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers um, for this meeting as well, giving me the opportunity uh, to talk about a topic that's uh, dear to my heart. And um, the topic, of course, is energy, which we, uh, we hear about on a daily basis and um, the uh, influence that it has on so many different aspects uh, of our life, uh, both as individuals and um, globally. So I'm going to talk to you today about, about future energy and give you uh, some, some background and comment on some of the directions that are taking place currently um, and uh, give you some insight uh, into that. So I'll start with some of the challenges and drivers. Uh, probably you've heard a lot about net zero 2050. There's been a lot uh, in the news about that. Um, talk about carbon capture and storage, sometimes done just to sequester carbon, but sometimes used uh, to convert um, carbon dioxide to usable chemicals, for example. Uh, electrification and uh, energy storage, some of the environmental impacts of the choices that we make, and uh, also to talk about the influence of the directions that we're going in um, with respect to geopolitical stability, water usage, and some social aspects as, as well, and then end with some closing uh, thoughts. It's a big topic, uh, but I hopefully will give you um, some insight into, uh, into these uh, different areas. Uh, so if you were to put down a list of, of um, driving goals, if you like, or, or comments on uh, energy in the 21st century. Many people have, have stated different aspects of this. Um, but we do recognize that energy is one of the uh, most important challenges that we do have in the 21st century. It forms a nexus with many different things, uh, health, water, um, the well-being of people, um, just a numerous number of, of different aspects of, of human life and of the planet. Um, we do expect to see a very large requirement for energy as we move forward, uh, partially based on population growth, but also the demand that we see uh, for a certain uh, level of uh, livelihood. And uh, these, are, these are big drivers, uh, many uh, other drivers as well. Um, what we do need to do is we need to have energy in a form that's clean and sustainable and um, ideally is carbon dioxide or climate change and nature uh, impact free as much as possible. Um, and ideally, uh, it would be democratically available uh, to different sectors, different peoples, countries, uh, so that we have worldwide uh, peace and prosperity. 
So I think everybody's uh, seen uh, the type of population growth that we're looking at. Uh, we, I think as of November, we passed the 8 billion uh, mark. Um, a lot of that growth has been in the um, underdeveloped countries, uh, but the world energy consumption um, is increasing significantly uh, with respect to, uh, to energy. Um, very interestingly, uh, the developed countries have often been targeted as, for example, in the uh, Kyoto Protocol, uh, to take total responsibility. Um, in this case, in, in the Kyoto Protocol, uh, the whole onus was put on the developed countries, but I think we're moving away from that to look at every country has some level of responsibility uh, to manage, um, manage energy and climate change. So there's a quote, quote there from Antonio, Guterres, who's the UN Secretary uh, General, basically highlighting this point. Um, if we kind of look at the world today, uh, and uh, we look at it in this case, uh, this is um, a time resolve Mercator map showing kind of the uh, areas um, where we have a lot of human activity. You can see that human activity is, is increasing uh, globally. Um, and uh, basically, with, with that implication of increased energy and the increased occupation there, we need to look at ways of basically balancing energy, nature, and, uh, and climate change. You can see at the, at the bottom here, um, we can uh, basically look at our, our biosphere or our atmosphere, uh, basically about 75% of our atmosphere is within 10 kilometers of the surface of the, of the planet. Um, these all have limited, um, you know, limited capacity for what you can put into, into them. Same with even our oceans, which cover around 71% uh, of the planet. So all of these have capacity limits. So if you get to a point where you're, you know, you're changing or influencing uh, these areas, uh, then you're going to expect changes, and they should ideally be in a positive direction. So just going back to where we started from, so the first part of the Industrial Revolution, starting around 1700s, we had a high reliance on coal. Coal was used for uh, steam power. It was kind of a second Industrial Revolution that occurred in the middle 1800s. Uh, particularly with the discovery of oil um, initially, for example, in Pennsylvania here, um, and larger scale manufacturing and industrialization. We can see electric grids forming in the early 1900s and then assembly lines here with Model T Fords, for example. Uh, the interesting thing was that even in the mid 1800s, renewables were being used. Um, but with the discovery of, uh, of oil, we basically uh, converted uh, to an oil-based um, um, world. And uh, that's influenced us uh, ever since. So you might ask yourself um, about oil. Uh, in particular, you might say, well, where, when does this oil epoch um, change when 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 it is I mean, in, in geological time it's probably just a blip uh, on that time scale um, but you know how long is it an interesting aspect of this is that if we look at around 2014 you know early uh, 2000 up to that point people had looked at oil uh, coal and gas on a sustainability a basis, right? How long would it last? How long could it meet our needs? And uh, interesting, you know, looking at the forecasting here, you can see a large, um, a large component by 2050 here is still uh, fossil fuels, uh, but you can see that a lot of things have started to peak by then. So sustainability was the uh, was the major major drive. Um, of course, when we run out of reserves, we always look for more resources, and this usually comes at higher risk and increasing cost as well. Uh, also means more issues with nature, biodiversity, other aspects, because uh, these are much more difficult. So, for example, the oil sands we have in, in Alberta would probably fall at one point into this, and, and also shale oil into this category here, where there's increased cost. 
Um, we were certain we could get it out of there, but there were a lot of implications for that upstream, upstream processing uh, of oil and also of gas as well and, and coal. Um, so, uh, you know, what's, we, we could continue to find uh, additional resources. Some people claimed at this point we could last for another 200 years on, on coal. But what really changed was climate change, but the drive um, and, and knowledge of that and the accept, acceptance of that, that became the main driver for trying to move away from fossil fuels. So it's worth mentioning uh, two aspects, adaptation and uh, mitigation. If we're gonna move towards a, a net zero uh, basis where we have no net uh, production of carbon dioxide. That doesn't mean up to that point we haven't uh, put a lot of greenhouse gases uh, into the atmosphere. Uh, we would call this a mitigation strategy. What we're trying to get back to is a balance and get back to uh, you know normal conditions. However, the transition to get to net zero is always going to require some form of adaptation. I think we can currently see that. We just have to look at the news. Um, you know, there's immediate effects of current climate change. We see sea level rise, more intense uh, and extreme uh, fluctuating weather, uh, food insecurity, for example. Often the local jurisdictions, um, local governments um, are really at the forefront of that because they have to plan, they have to do urban planning or rural planning uh, to try to mitigate some of those issues. So that's really an adaptation uh, process uh, that's required as we as we implement this mitigation strategy. I want to bring your attention um, to um, the two flagship reports uh, that were, came out in uh, 2021. Uh, one was from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. It was the sixth assessment report. Uh, the following report, other reports came out in 2022. Uh, but the other one was a global um, roadmap uh, for the energy sector called Net Zero 2050, which is a very large, massive document, uh, but has very significant information in it. So if we look at, if we, um, look at that, um, we uh, can find that there's some scenarios that are laid out. So for example, in this case, we have uh, five scenarios here. Uh, for different um, approaches to reducing carbon dioxide emissions uh, per year. Um, so what you can see here is we have a very aggressive one here, um, and then we have uh, less aggressive ones going up to business as usual and even more than business as, as, uh, as uh, usual. Um, where, uh, this is zero here, I don't know if you can see it at the back, but where these lines cross the uh, zero axis here is where we have uh, net zero um, emissions. And you can see this is the year 2050. So only this one case here would actually get us close to net zero uh, by 2050. Uh, the other ones are increasingly longer time frames. There was also a number of, um, of different uh, temperature analyses that were done for these dif different scenarios, which essentially showed um, that if, if we use the aggressive scenario here, uh, we might be able to maintain uh, temperatures by the year 2100 to about 1.5 to uh, 2 degrees. But if we were even on business as usual here, uh, we have the potential to get up to a 6 degree change, which is a from a global uh, point of view is a very significant uh, change. So again, uh, we could show what, what impact that has uh, on temperature. Here we have temperature on this axis and the years here. So you can see with this uh, a lower um, case scenario where we've, we've reduced emissions quite significantly, we're maintaining around a two degree level of increase uh, by the year 2100. Uh, however, with a business as usual case, we're up into a much, much higher temperatures. This shows some of the ranges in temperature that we, uh, we, we could expect from this type of modeling. So these are very significant uh, causes and effects. So in the, the net zero 2050 plan, um, to look at how we actually get down to uh, zero um, um, net CO2 production, uh, taking starting, you know, kind of in the year 2020 here, 
We're taking into account here activity increases. So this is due to population, increased uh, industri industrialization and advancement. And then the measures here to reduce the CO2 emissions. And you can see how these are broken up between, uh, between different areas. Certainly wind and solar is starting to play a very big, big role as a renewable here. Uh, behavior um, and avoided demand uh, is is always a, a really good approach if possible. Uh, you can see that that plays a role as well. Um, so by the year 2030, we have this minus 50 degree um, uh, change, and then we add again uh, more activity due to population growth and due to increased activity. And then the measures here to get us uh, down to, uh, to zero by 2050. So this is just a, a pictorial kind of explanation of all the data analysis and all the work that uh, was involved uh, behind uh, creating this. Also interesting to look at our total energy supply. And uh, again, we can see the calendar years here out to 2050. Uh, we can see where basically uh, you know, we are right now, we have still a very strong dependence on coal, oil, and natural gas, the large three uh, fossil fuels. But different from the previous uh, forecasting, which was based on sustainability, you can see by 2050 here that uh, this plays a much uh, less significant role in our overall uh, energy uh, portfolio uh, for, for, the, for the planet. And here you can see what's taking up the balance of that energy requirement. Uh, we see bioenergy, of course, uh, and renewables um, playing quite a, quite a significant role uh, in doing that. And I'm going to talk more about uh, the role that renewables uh, are going to play. Um, the paradigm shift there, of course, today is that uh, renewables at utility scale are actually cheaper than natural gas in many jurisdictions. So um, another example of this is uh, looking at, uh, here we have unabated fossil fuels. Look at the progress here out to 2050. Uh, here you can see low emission um, energy uh, technologies that are taking up that um, decrease here, or that gap, if you like, um, and see how that's uh, changing with, with time out, out, out to 2050. Uh, but you can see that unabated fossil fuels in the scenario analysis of the plan that was laid out uh, would be uh, would be very small by 2050, and by 2050 we'd have a you know very large uh, portfolio of, of things uh, like uh, renewables, as an example, and also uh, carbon capture um, could also play a role as well. So talking about carbon capture um, usage and storage, you know, how beneficial is it? We talk about uh, our inputs here, which could be biofuels or fossil fuels. Uh, we have to process that. This is all upstream processing, but in those, that processing, there's fugitive gas leakage. Um, that means if we're uh, emitting um, or, or letting uh, methane, for example, uh, into the environment, it has a very high global uh, warming potential. So there are definitely issues if we have any type of fugitive gas leakage. We need to know what that is before the processing and after. And then if we have carbon capture, there's only a percentage of that that we're able to capture. We also have leakage here. All of this to get carbon dioxide and then either put it in storage or use it for something else. In this case, uh, we're looking, this is just symbolic of enhanced oil recovery, which is something really we don't want to do uh, because it doesn't, the containment of CO2 in that process is not that, not that good. So you have to really question the whole aspect of carbon capture and storage uh, and utilization in the overall plan. And, um, whoops, sorry. I'll give you an example here, a Canadian example. Uh, the Shell Quest carbon capture and storage in northern uh, Alberta is probably one of the largest uh, demonstrated carbon capture units in the world. And um, there's an important point to make here. Uh, in most of the um, promotion, sorry, 
most of the promotion here of carbon capture, we normally uh, very high rates of, of capture are quoted, usually in the range of 90%. Uh, but an audit was done on that uh, particular uh, carbon capture unit, again, one of the largest in the world, and it was only like 39 to 48%. So whenever we have uh, carbon capture, it's not gonna be 100% perfect. There's still gonna be fugitive uh, emissions um, that are going uh, into the atmosphere. So it's not, it's not a complete solution. And, uh, you know, one may argue, uh, you know, does it really make sense, for, for example, for a Canadian hydrogen strategy to be converting uh, natural gas um, to hydrogen and then using carbon capture um, <clears throat> when there are so many issues with, with that process, not, not only to mention that, the issues, but uh, also it's, it's very expensive. It adds a lot of additional costs can almost double the cost of the fuel. So I was involved uh, with a number of people writing a letter to the government saying that this is really the wrong uh, direction uh, for Canada to be going in. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to convince you that, of that uh, as we move on. Um, also, a number of people are realizing that if we don't actually take CO2 completely out of the picture, we try to keep it uh, in at some level through carbon capture, that's not a solution uh, to the problem that we have. And um, I'm using this as an example. This is Elon Musk's uh, call, which is the largest one in history at the time. It was a hundred uh, million dollar um, prize for carbon removal. Uh, but what was noteworthy about it uh, were the solutions that would not be considered. And many of what you'll see here are things that people are doing uh, in this area of carbon capture. And just to point out a couple of things, um, you know, we have to be able to show on a life cycle basis um, that, that we're um, removing the carbon. Uh, needs to be net negative in any process that we're considering. And uh, we shouldn't be depleting, for example, existing natural carbon stores. So the whole aspect of biofuels is something we have to look at very caref carefully. If we're capturing carbon to make a biofuel, then we're combusting it again. We're just putting carbon back uh, in, into the environment. Uh, so it needs to be looked at very, very closely. Um, so again, in the... Um, IEA's uh, net zero 2050 plan, electrification is a very key aspect of that plan and moving in that direction. Um, and that means that global electricity demand within that plan would be required to double uh, by 2050, which is a very significant uh, level of electrification. Um, areas where we would see the largest increases would be in the production of uh, hydrogen industry and transportation. Um, what we're seeing in this uh, particular um, uh, picture here, uh, so we see different industries here, the uh, solid dots here show the percentage given on the, on the right hand side of that particular activity that has to be uh, electrified. Um, and then we see the progress uh, between 2020, 2030, and 2050 in terms of the energy that's required. So, for example, if we look at light duty vehicles here, we would see uh, that in the case of 2050, if we have electrification using uh, battery based type of, uh, uh, of uh, vehicles, we would have a very significant amount of that industry that would be electrified uh, around 75% and so on. And also you can see the importance here of merchant hydrogen, which is a commodity that's being traded and, and shipped around the world, um, also requiring a significant amount of elect electrification. So um, uh, electricity from renewables, what's happened with that? Um, if we even go back to around uh, you know, 2010, we can see that uh, renewables were quite expensive and uh, in order to even implement uh, renewables uh, for example as was done in Ontario there had to be guaranteed contracts and price fixing and everything what people didn't realize um, and they should have is that uh, you know that the cost would come down and here you can see for example with uh, solar how uh, dramatic the cost reduction has been in the reduction of, of cost of renewables. 
going out to where we are today. Same with wind as well. Uh, nuclear power uh, has increased uh, to some extent for a number of different, different reasons. Uh, combined cycle, uh, um, natural gas combined cycle power plant, um, that's uh, decreased a bit, but mar marginally. Um, and then we, um, we have, as, as I said, we have our um, um, wind and solar, which now is less than uh, the use, efficient use in a combined cycle power plants of natural gas. So this is a real paradigm shift. And that's, you know, the, the economists commented on this in 2018, that uh, there is a transition that's occurring here um, that we need to be paying attention to. Uh, these are the global weighted averages now uh, for utility scale solar and uh, for onshore wind. And you can see that they're, uh, they're you know, getting down to a very uh, low point. Um, again, I just uh, draw your attention to what happens uh, when we look at uh, technologies and processes that perhaps we might measure in uh, dollars per kilowatt here. Uh, so we might have a mature technology which follows uh, this type of decrease in cost uh, with volume, uh, but we may have new technologies that we're looking at and our volume is low at that at this point. Uh, one of the biggest issues is comparing uh, the cost of technologies on the, uh, on the same basis. They should be measured at the same level of, of scale. And so what happens often in the media and even, even in, in reports that you know better is that we'll, prepare, um, we'll compare a cost point here at a low volume with a cost point here at a high volume. And that can lead to very erroneous results in the prediction or forecasting of, uh, of where uh, the technology or process is going. So now I want to come back to uh, hydrogen. Um, we have basically many different colors of hydrogen, but these are the three main uh, types. Hydrogen will play a very a big role in decarbonization of uh, global energy. So uh, we have, for example, from natural gas with steam methane reforming, we produce hydrogen, but we also produce carbon dioxide. Um, so this is just called gray hydrogen. We're just putting CO2 into the atmosphere. If we do that with carbon capture and storage called blue hydrogen, which is like the unit that I saw, showed you for the Shell uh, Quest project, that would be called uh, blue hydrogen. And then green hydrogen is where we use electricity and water to produce hydrogen. Um, Canada and each of the provinces has their own hydrogen plan. As you might suspect, uh, those provinces like BC, which have a lot of renewable electricity, about 95% of our electricity uh, comes from uh, renewables uh, are looking at green hydrogen. Alberta is largely focused on blue hydrogen. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, you have to have carbon capture and storage, uh, which has, it has its issues. Interestingly enough, um, the prairie provinces, for example, Alberta and Saskatchewan, um, are implementing renewables at a very uh, high rate. Um, and uh, the expected percentage of electricity production, for example, in Alberta would be between 30 and 35% from renewables by 2030. Uh, the same for Texas. So these are traditionally uh, fossil fuel based uh, jurisdictions, uh, but you can see that the independent power producers are really moving uh, renewables forward at a very quick, uh, quick rate. So when we talk about hydrogen um, or elec and electricity, um, we can see that they're both coupled. Hydrogen is what's called an e-fuel. It can, can be ver converted to electricity or electricity can convert uh, water back to hydrogen. It's a very, very simple relationship here. It's very reversible. Water and electricity goes to hydrogen and oxygen. These two sectors are, are coupled if you're looking at an electrified uh, type of energy system. You have a hydrogen economy and you have an electron or electrical economy here. Here we have our renewables um, and they can feed into batteries directly or heat pumps and chillers, other uh, electrical devices directly. Uh, they can be used uh, through electrolysis to produce hydrogen. Um, and hydrogen can go the other way. So we can store um, uh, electrons in hydrogen and when we need it, uh, we can uh, pump it back into that. 
the thing with the hydrogen economy, there's many areas that are contributing to uh, carbon right at the moment, in, which include things like the steel industry, uh, cement, uh, food industry, I could go on here, fertilizers, uh, petrochemical industry, um, and heavy duty uh, equipment and transportation uh, that really only work with, with hydrogen. They don't work with batteries um, for a num number of reasons. Um, I'm an expert in both areas, so I'm, I'm hopefully being somewhat agnostic when I'm talking about this. Um, and um, so these two, two sectors are basically uh, coupled. Um, so the issue at the moment is uh, uh, one of the potential issues is the cost of hydrogen. And there's an effort to bring the cost of, of hydrogen, US dollars per kilogram of hydrogen, uh, down to uh, one, kilo, uh, one US dollar per uh, kilogram of hydrogen. Uh, the Department of Energy in the US has a very, very large program called the 111 program, uh, which is basically uh, one US dollar for one uh, kilogram of hydrogen in one decade. Um, so it's kind of looked at over a 10, a 10 year scope. Um, what this shows here is the range of costs that we have in US dollars uh, to, today uh, for um, hydrogen. Uh, fossil fuels, typically uh, natural gas, fall kind of in this range down here around two US dollars. Um, so uh, showing a path to getting down there involves uh, reduction in electrolyzer cost, uh, electricity cost uh, is important, but of course uh, renewables are coming down in, in um, cost, um, also efficiency and, and lifetime, so a number of different factors. So there definitely are planned ways to do that. Looking at it more from an engineering point of view, we can look at the balance of cost, for example, in the uh, electrolyzer here, see a large portion of this has to do with components that are engineered and materials, which is all, all very, very doable. Um, I just want to mention uh, that, um, you know, similarly, uh, going back to the late 1990s, um, uh, fuel cells were looked at as non-commercial non um, and um, what uh, we found was that, you know, around 1989, there was no possibility of them being commercially uh, possible. Um, but you can see in one decade, which is the length of time that DOE, for example, has set uh, for bringing the cost of hydrogen down, um, that it was able to go from here up to a next generation technology that was well above the limits required by the automotive industry. And today it's double that. So, uh, you know, a, a technology can improve very quickly if there's will and policy to make it happen. And uh, we've learned a lot from, from that period of time. Um, this a little more complicated here shows the reduction in cost of, uh, of hydrogen here for different scenarios. One of the key factors is uh, the um, electricity cost here. Uh, you can see two different scenarios for two uh, different costs of electricity. Uh, again, utility-based uh, uh, solar and wind is somewhere in between right at the moment. Uh, here you can see this dashed line is the fossil fuel range that we have today. If you add carbon capture and utilization, you can even double the cost of that. So already um, with these, this type of analysis here, you can see uh, that we're actually in the range of cost competitive now, cost competitive just now uh, with, um, with, um, um, sorry, I lost my, my train of thought here. It, it's cost competitive now with, uh, with blue hydrogen using fossil fuels. So you might ask the question, is it really necessary that we go down a path uh, with fossil fuels and, and carbon capture at, at, at this point when we're really, the end game is to get to, uh, to green hydrogen. Um, so that brings us to storage. Uh, when we're using renewables, renewables are intermittent. You can do uh, different strategies to get more constant power. Uh, but one of the issues that we have is um, we have our base load power, uh, but we have other forms of, of uh, energy that we're inputting into the system and we don't use that all the time. So 
Uh, you can see in this hatched area here, um, that, that uh, hatched area, is, uh, that energy is surplus energy, which at the moment in most jurisdictions is just thrown away. It's a huge amount of electricity that's lost completely. Um, that we have the opportunity to capture if we have good storage uh, methods. And, uh, you know, I give you an example here, this in Ontario in 2019, this was about 6.5 terawatt hours, which is a very significant amount of energy um, that, uh, that basically was being uh, lost, curtailed, and even in some cases, uh, power companies are paid not to produce um, electricity. So this is really a waste of, of uh, potential energy. Storage for uh, electrification is very, very limited. Um, we know, you know, that the elect electrification or electrical grid uh, is, is perhaps the largest supply chain of anything, and yet our storage capability is, is very, very limited, sub 0.1%. Whereas if you look at crude oil uh, production, um, the amount of oil storage that we have in reservoirs uh, and in other areas is quite significant. It's around uh, 13%. This means that if we have issues, uh, we can use those reservoirs and they can cover a significant period of time, which can be uh, in, the, in the period of time of you know, months. Um, whereas uh, for electrification at the moment, we're, we're basically limited to uh, minutes. So, this is a big challenge in terms of electrification is to come up uh, with the uh, storage uh, to be able to do that. Uh, batteries are, are being used uh, for smaller uh, type systems at the moment. And this is an example here in, uh, in South Australia. Australia has done a, a lot of uh, battery type storage. Uh, smaller unit here, uh, this could run, for example, 30,000 homes uh, for one hour. It's based on uh, used uh, Tesla uh, lithium battery packs. When they reach a certain level uh, in the EV, then they're, um, they're not useful for the EV anymore. Um, but it's still very limited. And even if you look at some of the battery storage now, that's 10 times the size, it still has limitations. Um, so, what we have to look at is, you know, where, where do batteries fit with respect to other types of storage technologies? And these are a number of different types of storage technologies that we have. We have uh, power on one side and energy on the other. Um, this is a, a design type of chart that we have to use for a particular type of application. What you can see here is the batteries kind of fall in the middle here. Uh, these dash lines here show uh, the period of time you could operate with that device as a storage device. Um, so you can see, you know, lift, you can see where the stars are there. Those are some of the larger battery, installed battery storage uh, cases that we have. Uh, but they still don't get us uh, into kind of seasonal storage or long-term storage. Um, whereas you can see that pumped hydro, PHS, and hydrogen, for example, allow us uh, to do seasonal type storage, which can uh, last, for example, uh, for a month or two months, which is the type of storage you need if, uh, you know, if a country, for example, like Ukraine, um, was, uh, was off, the, uh, off the normal uh, energy grid. So um, it's an interesting way of, of looking at it. We certainly see that battery technology has a lot of room to support storage kind of in the smaller to medium area, but for longer term seasonal storage, it, it, does, it won't uh, be able to manage that. Um, people were looking at synthetic natural gas, uh, also, which is a, if you combine hydrogen with carbon dioxide, uh, you can form uh, synthetic uh, methane, basically. Uh, this has definitely fallen out of uh, favor because of the potential for um, of contributing to climate change if you have leakage. So um, the major focus now for large scale is either pumped hydro storage if you have that or, or hydrogen out here. So the opportunities, where do they exist? Um, a lot of this has to be based on infrastructure that we already have. Those are existing assets, so we have an opportunity to use them. 
Um, so in particular, intersection of, uh, of pipelines, some type of storage, for example, and our renewable source of energy in the grid are very uh, high priority or very uh, important uh, uh, intersection points because we basically can manage energy system at, at those points. Uh, to construct that infrastructure, of course, is very expensive. So can we make use of existing assets? And uh, just as an example here, if we look at the natural gas pipeline network in the United States, and we look at the electrical transmission grid, um, you can see that there's a, a huge, a very large opportunity for close, close proximity of pipelines and the, uh, and the grid system. So these intersection points become very important uh, uh, potential points for, for managing the, uh, the energy system. And uh, people uh, will look at the, at the intersection of, of a number of these uh, types of points and transportation as well. Um, so obviously uh, infrastructure systems have, have very large uh, challenges. Um, how they're used, the training of people, the, uh, how they're uh, implemented, how they're built. Um, I'm using here as an example new infrastructure systems for lightweight passenger vehicles. We basically have two types of electric vehicles. We have a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle and we have a battery based vehicle. So a comparison of the uh, infrastructure costs for those two approaches uh, becomes very important. Uh, Germany's done a lot of work as of some other jurisdictions as well, um, Asia as well. Uh, in this case, the Forschung Centrum, one of Europe's largest research centers, did this under contract to the German government. And uh, basically, it shows um, that as you move forward with these, both of these different types of infrastructures, um, initially, uh, battery electric vehicles are going to be, um, the infrastructure for that will, will be cheaper than for um, the hydrogen fuel cell base. Uh, approach, uh, but when you get up to large numbers, um, it actually switches, it goes the other way. So for long-term planning, you know, uh, how much commitment should we make to one type of infrastructure um, compared to another? Um, on a driving basis, uh, there, are, there are differences as well. Uh, essentially, this type of vehicle here, the fuel cell hydrogen vehicle, behaves very much the way our vehicles do today. You can charge it in two minutes. It has very long range and it works well in cold temperatures. Uh, EVs obviously work, I have one, work well under certain conditions, um, but not all conditions. So these are a lot, of, a lot of decisions that have to be made. And you know, one of the challenges I think as we implement energy policy and plans is we have to look at the longer term uh, ramifications of committing uh, to one infrastructure or another, how we do that. Um, you know, uh, I can use the example of Canada as sort of committed to only EV vehicles by 2035, right? Uh, but if you look at the OECD countries right now, 14 countries that have made that type of commitment, Canada is sitting either at 13th or 4th or last place in terms of preparedness for that. So this is a big challenge. <laughs> um, the immense growth that we're looking at uh, is in terms of the terawatt hours, if you like, or lithium based um, that we would need for battery um, based vehicles is, is extremely significant. So you can see here where the, on this curve here, the yellow one here shows the improvement in the, um, in the, in the type of performance that we need. This is where the Tesla 3 sits right at the moment. Uh, the green area here uh, shows you kind of the the increase in the amount of, of lithium and energy that we require. Uh, in order to even get close to that, we need to be producing something like 20 to 30 gigafactories uh, every year, um, which is, is not happening, <laughs> of course. Uh, there's a nice example in the bottom right-hand corner there of uh, a gigafactory in, um, in Nevada, which produces about 500 or half a million um, battery packs per year. So this is a massive uh, undertaking if we're, you know, we're committing uh, to uh, battery electric uh, vehicles. 
in terms of meeting uh, not only the performance requirements, uh, but the supply. So that brings me to the environmental focus because this has to be a very important part of our consideration um, when we're looking at the energy plan going forward. And uh, I prefer, and I think most people do, an environmentally focused uh, type of, um, of tri triple bottom line uh, approach. Um, in this case, everything should be done within an environmental uh, context. And then we look at the intersection of technology policy, economic and social aspects to find that region that's manageable and sustainable. Um, a little different than kind of the conventional way of looking at it, which is more um, anthropogenic, where we have the environment only overlapping in, uh, in one, one area. So the environment has to be a major consideration uh, in, in how we choose to go forward. So uh, coming back to, uh, to lithium, the environmental impact of that type of growth in lithium use is, is enormous. Um, and so we need, if we're going to do that, we need to understand what the environmental impacts are and how to reduce um, the significance of that. So we basically have two types of lithium uh, mining. We have open pit lithium mining and we have the solars, which are these separation ponds. Uh, basically filled with uh, brine and we separate out the uh, lithium uh, from, from the brines. Uh, both of these have quite a significant impact on the environment and so different processes are really needed uh, to clean up this aspect. Uh, the proposal that's on the table now is to start doing deep sea mining for lithium. Um, and uh, as you might guess, there's Canadian mining companies that are behind this, that are driving this, uh, targeting the South Pacific area. So there's really very poor regulation, very poor understanding of the environmental consequences of, of doing that. Um, and so this is potentially a very, very big issue if we move forward uh, with lithium, lithium batteries um, and using that as, as one of our major approaches. Um, I formed a company with some of my students, uh, which is called Mangrove Lithium. Uh, we've got Bill Gates Foundation funding and, and a number of other large types of funding. Uh, we're trying to address the chemical processing aspect of lithium uh, to make that more environmentally friendly and also to look at the recycling uh, as well, the recycling aspect, because that has to be a very important uh, point. Um, what you can see here on the bottom right-hand corner here is the gap that we actually have between what the demand requirement is going to be and what we're actually uh, forecasted to be able to supply. So that's an enormous, enormous gap that we're looking at here in terms of what we need in terms of um, lithium carbonate and lithium hydroxide. And uh, could, this could be managed, I guess, with fuel cell electric vehicles as well. Uh, but it shows that, you know, it, it's really, it's really the gap is out of sync with what the plan is to do. So the obvious approach there is to look at more abundant materials. And we fortunately have these types of maps where we can look at the abundance of different uh, elements. Um, what we see, for example, is that you know, lithium is significantly lower in abundance, for example, than sodium or iron. Those are both good uh, battery making uh, materials. Um, however, the issue always is that we're going to lose performance. And when we lose performance, that changes um, the analysis uh, again. But this is a, a good way of guiding the work that's going on uh, in, in these different areas where we're looking at critical uh, mineral use of critical materials. So now that brings me to uh, the transition and what happens with geopolitics. Um, we can see, for example, in the war in Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, um, the impact that that's had on, on Western Europe and, and globally, to be, to be honest. Um, you can see in Europe that there's a very significant pipeline structure, most of that coming from Russia to supply natural gas and oil. Here we have the Baltic Sea up here, Nord Stream 1, 
Uh, Nord Stream 2 was uh, in, the, in the process as well, not shown here. Um, both of those, of course, are, are shut off now. A lot of the natural gas went through the Ukraine. Uh, that's basically been shut down. Uh, so uh, natural gas has, has been used um, basically as a political, uh, political tool, creating uh, immense uh, energy insecurity. Uh, we potentially have that issue also with lithium as well. Uh, once you have a, a major resource that's, that's in the hands of one country, uh, then you're much more exposed uh, to uh, political um, instability. Um, China, for example, has a very significant control over most aspects of the lithium battery uh, supply chain. At least 65% of it's controlled by China at the moment. So it creates some very interesting uh, problems. Um, so how, how's, how, has, how has this changed things? What we have seen is that Germany has been able to react and the other European countries very quickly to this change in their energy uh, system uh, because of Russia. Um, they've been able now to keep the reservoirs full. Uh, they've had a mild winter this year as well. Uh, so all those factors have helped them to manage this transition, which has been very quick. Uh, but what it's also doing is it's pushing them very quickly uh, towards the energy transition that they were already uh, in the process of, of doing. Um, and now the time frame for that has moved up very, very quickly. You can see here a uh, breakdown, for example, in Germany of their total energy use. Uh, you can see renewables there constitute about 41 percent uh, of their energy energy supply but they still relied on natural gas and coal um, and so um, the transition has been very difficult without the supply of natural gas uh, from from russia but just to give you an idea on the acceleration this work is already under underway uh, they're fast tracking a number of green hydrogen hubs in western europe particularly in Germany. Um, and we're talking about very large quantities of energy that will, will come from that. So this will require shipping of hydrogen and production of hydrogen in those uh, ports. Um, just finishing up with the last few slides here. Um, when we think about the energy plan, also we need to think about the access and the energy security aspect. So one of the good things about renewables that is that every jurisdiction has some form of renewable that they can use. So from that point of view, uh, that's democratic. Most countries have some form of water also they have access to. So this creates a, an opportunity for many countries um, to look at hydrogen as, as a potential commodity um, and uh, gain from that opportunity. And this is certainly happening in Africa at the moment. Um, Nigeria, um, South Africa, uh, Namibia, uh, these are all countries that are in the process or have already signed contracts or already doing development uh, in this area. Uh, you can see uh, the type of potential here. I mean, this really can't be used for much, uh, but it does have you know, water, seaport access, very, very good solar uh, energy possibilities. And uh, some of the benefits that potentially can happen, for example, with solar is we can use agrivoltaics, uh, for example, uh, to create an agricultural based economy <clears throat> as well. Um, and so that's an interesting uh, dual uh, positive effect that, that's potential. Um, so water, the water nexus, here you can see the growth uh, in capacity, of in, uh, installed capacity that's taken place uh, between 1999 and uh, present day. Uh, what you can see is that most of the uh, renewable um, electricity capacity is coming from solar and from wind. Um, and uh, solar and wind actually um, are not water intensive like many other energy industries. Uh, so this is a, a really good way to decouple uh, the requirement uh, for um, for water in uh, in energy technologies, which is a, is a problem right at the moment. 
as an example, in the U.S., about 40% of fresh water uh, withdrawal is, is used for uh, thermoelectric uh, generation. And obviously, resources like our oil sands and shale oil biofuels and also carbon capture and sequestration also use significant amounts of water. So water is a looming problem um, that probably will hit us almost before anything else more seriously. So this is a very important consideration. And um, the other aspect, if we talk about biodiversity or nature, you know, which of these types of approaches have the least impact. Um, and um, this is a very difficult uh, topic uh, to explore because uh, there aren't uh, enough evaluation tools or enough data in many cases to, to come to uh, clear conclusions. Uh, but we do know that solar and wind appear to have, uh, in many cases, the least impact on global um, biodiversity, whereas something like coal or unconventional oil would have a major impact. Um, so again, uh, those renewables seem uh, to be in a position to, to help us. Um, and so um, this is uh, good news. Here we see a floating, uh, floating um, photovoltaic panels here. Um, both of these are taken uh, uh, from uh, pictures in China. And then we have nuclear power. So where is that going? So we've had the issue, of course, uh, with Three Mile Island, uh, Chernobyl, Fukushima. Um, this has really um, created a very bad picture of nuclear power. But um, in parallel, nuclear power has has developed and moved forward um, in uh, in many ways uh, to be more safer and um, and to uh, improve. Um, in terms of waste. Uh, so the um, small modular reactors um, look like they have opportunities. The issue is that they're more expensive than renewables, and um, but they can still, could still play an important role. And uh, fusion is in progress. We even in uh, Burnaby here have uh, General Fusion, which is um, a major uh, fusion-based company looking at a new a new type of plasma fusion, um, and it's had a lot of global interest. And uh, for example, uh, the International uh, Thermal Nuclear Experimental Reactor Plant in uh, Cateresh in southern France um, is over seventy-five percent uh, complete. And probably we've seen some of the news recently where the Q factor is is greater than one. So some of the key fundamental aspects of fusion are starting to be uh, shown, but it's still a long way off, I would say, within the context of the net zero 2050 in terms of, of having it implemented. But it will be a game changer when it happens. So I just stand up here with just some closing thoughts. Um, I think we see that electrification um, is, uh, is, is going to uh, be a, a cornerstone of this plan. Uh, we're seeing a massive requirement for electrification and phasing out of fossil fuels. Um, carbon capture and storage or uh, sequestration <coughs> may be important, uh, but it should result in net negative emissions and uh, also should not provide a diversion to the path that we're on. Um, also, creation of new fossil fuel projects doesn't fit with the plan either. So. For example, the Canadian government's announcement about going forward with Bay Nord, uh, the Nord project just off Newfoundland, um, doesn't really fit at all with, with the project at all, <laughs> or with the plan. Um, storage is very, very key to this, the success of this plan, and something that most countries don't have enough of that needs to be pushed forward. Um, I hope I've convinced you that, that hydrogen is a very important for decarbonation, decarbonation, uh, particularly in the very hard areas to decarbonate. Uh, you can't do that with batteries. <laughs> um, I mentioned some of them here. Um, so we need to make sure that when we're choosing our path here, uh, that we're reducing the, uh, the issues with water, um, the issues with environmental and biodiversity aspects. Wind and solar, um, seem to be dominating, uh, look like the best opportunities there. 
And uh, there's also uh, social and economic benefits with this plant that are potentially uh, very, very large because of the distributed nature. So I'll finish with um, this last slide. It's a quote uh, from the executive director of the IEA. It says, the world has a huge challenge ahead of it to move to net zero by 2050 uh, from a narrow possibility to a practical reality. And um, this is really the Mount Everest of our challenges. Uh, we've been able to tackle other global issues like the, uh, the ozone issue, acid rain, uh, DDT, uh, but the magnitude of the, and complexity of this problem uh, makes it uh, very, very difficult to uh, achieve. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. If there are questions from the audience, there is a question from Ralph. Just David, a question about three, four months ago, the president of Germany the, the president of Germany and the president of Mercedes-Benz met with the Prime Minister Trudeau and the Trudeau cabinet to sign an MOU to do a hydro technology project in Stephenville, Newfoundland, presumably shipping it in some manner to Germany. Is that feasible? Yes. Yes. It's already I mean, because the example you gave, for example, was Namibia, and there's yes. one. There's one looks like it's going to be quite. Yeah. much closer so 80, around 85 percent of our international trade is by ship shipping so you know we're going to have to rely very much on on shipping um the issue of how we ship it is is the question and different formats have already been demonstrated some between australia and japan for example uh, ammonia looks like a very a very good carrier um, that's been demonstrated. There's another form of absorbing or hydrogenating uh, organic hydrides that's been used as well. Uh, and then there's liquefaction. And there's some new approaches uh, which have some interesting benefits with liquefied hydrogen as well. So there's been at least three or four different uh, methods that have been uh, looked at, at at scale, at very, I should say, at very large quantities. Um, but there's a lot of research going into how best to do that. Distribution is, is a very key aspect of making all of this work as well. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, but apparently they, they prefer you to sit down. Oh, I'm Before sorry. We're, we're... Not very good at following the instructions. Give you the microphone. And, and use that one. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, so um, you didn't really um, uh, touch on um, rapid transit and fast trains and and all of the uh, you know the kind of um, public transportation that seems to be why Europe is sort of doing better than we are in terms of, of uh, climate change so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on this so given given that Canada seems to be putting a lot of their focus on electrical via you know EVs and all that rather than than the, than than public transportation. Yeah, no, it's a it's a good question. Um, we have Canada is one of the first countries in the world to demonstrate um, bus fleets uh, run, for example, on hydrogen, um, and had some very successful uh, projects um, and demonstrations. Uh, but we haven't implemented them at scale, like or at a significant level, like some other uh, jurisdictions. So. Germany, as you rightly pointed out, has moved as moving a lot of areas, uh, for example, to electrification. So the train systems is a good example. Now, a, a, there's a significant part of that that's now running on hydrogen as an example. Um, buses, um, another another example. So these are opportunities. And I, you know, I think from a, for governments, it's really an excellent opportunity for governments to demonstrate their own homegrown uh, technology with the public service, for example. But for some reason, we we don't seem to be doing that in Canada, uh, whereas other countries are doing that that too. So I think it would be useful from the point of view of showcasing uh, possibilities and giving it a bit of a nudge to to help uh, you know help 
public opinion and 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 how and get people enthusiastic about it. I think we're seeing it in certain areas, like Vancouver, definitely seems to have embraced some aspects of battery electric vehicles. And there's quite a few, I think. Um, in uh, British, in Vancouver, I think, or in British Columbia, I think we, in North, in, as, as part of North America, I think we had the highest per capita purchase of electric vehicles of any jurisdiction. Uh, but if we look at the number of electric vehicles, for example, in British Columbia, it's still only around 1%, right? So it's, it's minuscule, right? And unless we build the infrastructure around that, it's not, it's not going to happen. Is we're going to run into major problems. In relationship to that and being here in Vancouver, really simple question. What in the world happened to Ballard Power with regard to these kinds of initiatives? It seems to have to sort of fading slowly into the background. Um, you know, Ballard is very active. Um, it's about almost owned by the Chinese now. Um, but it is very active in Europe and in Asia, um, and they're they're doing doing very well. But the company has transformed; it's changed. And uh, you know, I think it's like critical minerals, right? If our, if the Canadian government doesn't protect critical um, areas, um, again, we're going to lose that to uh, to other 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 countries. So. Yeah, it's not. It's definitely not a favor uh, in, in favorable light in the investment community in Vancouver because you know partially because of the the history it went through, but it's doing very well. Um, but the other aspect is that it's evolved from Ballard has evolved a whole ecosystem that spread throughout North America and to Europe in a number of of, of different areas related to energy and hydrogen in particular. Thank you, question Yeah, David, um, do you see any uh, potential in the future for seasonal storage with batteries at all? I mean, is anybody working in that area? Well, with the best batteries that we have today, um, I th it's, it's a long shot to get seasonal storage. Uh, there's just nothing that has that that type of material energy density that that can do that and the issue with the batteries are they scale linearly with weight and volume so that's why batteries don't work for very you know for um for large uh vehicles like transport large transport vehicles because they end up taking up too much of the the space and uh, you start running into the the problems um with just bas basic mechanics, right? <laughs> uh, friction, weight, all, all those things, right? So, um, yeah, they 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 work well within a certain framework, but not a universal framework. So that's a big challenge. There is a very significant amount of work looking at different um, low cost storage batteries that use earth abundant materials which is a really a really good thing to do so for mid you know medium type storage applications and that that could have a lot of benefits it might have less environmental impact and would be uh, more readily available to people because it would be lower cost um, and um, may also make it more available to more more people as well as opposed to having it controlled Thank you, David. Um, almost everything you've talked about is directed toward a single issue, and that's the climate problem and reducing carbon emissions. But I would argue that that's simply one symptom of a much bigger ecological mm -hmm. problem called overshoot. So the human enterprise is using every aspect of the natural environment faster than it can regenerate or assimilate. Right. So let's assume all of this worked, and I, we have a whole lot of discussion about that. And we double the scale of the human economy and we increase the population to 10 and a half billion people. What have we gained? We, we simply continued, I call this business as usual by alternative means, but it maintains and increases the degree of overshoot, the displacement of biodiversity, the destruction of soils, tropical deforestation, and so on and so forth. So isn't 
in the final analysis, if we're not willing to look at the whole question of overshoot, overconsumption, overpopulation, this is just feeding into the problem rather than, than solving it? Um, I'm not sure if it's feeding in. It's trying to fix a problem which should should be fixed in other ways, like, like as you're mentioning, right, with population growth, right? Um, that's that's going to have a significant impact on demand. So if, if we let things um, remain the way they are, then we're guaranteeing failure, right? So uh, I, I know there's very large issues that need to be addressed, but I think what basically what this plan is trying to do is the best with what we have right now and what, what's happening, right? But there are bigger questions like you're raising, uh, yeah, but absolutely. I guess my main point is that what this plan seems to further all of the wrong things we're doing rather than uh, move us in, in a different course. So shouldn't we be talking about reducing consumption, reducing demand for energy, rather than finding alternative ways of supplying even greater ways sure. of pillaging the planet? Okay. Yeah, no, I, I agree that, you know, it's um, um, the, the, best, the best approach is to reduce demand, right? Mm -hmm. That's the, the, the most potent uh, form of solution, right? But I'm not sure how, you know, how that's going to happen. Right? I didn't say it would be easy. I'm just saying we're not making a situation better. <laughs> Should we take some from the yeah. Zoom? Okay. Um, I'm just gonna ask some from online. Okay. Um, so this one came in kind of uh, right in the beginning of your talk and it says, why isn't tidal energy one of the three options you listed on your slide? Okay. Could you repeat the question one more time? No, no it says oh, tidal. 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 Yeah, why isn't tidal energy one of the three options? Tidal energy. Tidal, oh, energy. tidal energy. Sorry, now I thought, thought you were saying tidal. Um, in terms of the composition of the renewables, mm -hmm. it's just such a small part, it falls into the other category, which is a small part of the portfolio compositions in all the, all the area. It doesn't mean that it couldn't be large, larger, but the direction that's happening and is continuing to happen is that solar and wind are the dominant forms of renewable energy that are moving forward. Okay. And maybe it will play a larger role or more uh, specific role in some jurisdictions um, in, the, in the future, but it's not really, it's still at an early stage as well. I think that might be part of it, even though offshore wind is, has moved and advanced significantly. Okay, um, I've got another one here. In discussion, could you please clarify why, how carbon in the atmosphere is, quote, bad? I have never heard a good explanation of the role played by carbon. Is it actually carbon that's bad or is it a proxy for something else that causes atmospheric temperatures to increase? <laughs> Oh, that's a good question. And you'd be very, very able to answer that too. But, but the structure of, of carbon dioxide and of the molecules that cause green, um, greenhouse gas warming, GHG warming, is such that it can absorb um, certain uh, frequencies of the, uh, of the spectrum. Um, particularly in the infrared spectrum. And, and so um, that, uh, that, that causes the, the increase that, that we see. So it's a balance of what comes in from the sun, which has a different, a different type of spectral distribution and what goes out is different, uh, that's radiated back out. And uh, those molecules will absorb and retain um, and also uh, re-emit uh, those frequencies back to the surface of the planet. So it's an energy balance that's happening based on where absorption uh, takes place and, and where radiation and the molecules have to have the right structure to be able to participate in, in that. And it's uh, carbon dioxide is uh, one of those molecules, um, but uh, there are other types of molecules um, that don't have carbon in that also contribute, but we don't, 
we don't the quantity of carbon dioxide is by far the by far makes it the largest contributor to uh, warming I think it's another question on distribution, which was alluded to earlier. And I, I think it's for both the hydrogen and the electric side. Uh, in that my understanding, particularly with hydrogen, is it can't use, at least not without significant retrofits, the existing natural gas pipelines. And then obviously, if electricity is simultaneously being developed to that extent, how do you kind of solve this distribution problem in time when you need a ton of copper and you need to essentially replicate the entire natural gas distribution pipeline that or the pipelines that exist right now because that to me seems like a, a foundational challenge yes so it, it's a good question um at the beginning um you can you can actually put up to 20 percent hydrogen into natural gas pipelines so there's already a, re a reservoir at the beginning with the, the more limited amount of hydrogen that you're producing um, but you can also retrofit or you can modify pipelines as well to carry hydrogen and other countries have done that, oh, albeit not their whole system, but areas of their system. Germany again is another example of where, where, that's, where that's been done. Uh, but yes, to duplicate your whole pipeline structure um, would, would be, uh, be a big challenge. So I think uh, at least in the shorter term, um, the injection of hydrogen into natural gas pipelines, which could be as high as 15 to 20 percent, um, is, is an option to use existing assets. Modification of those assets is also possible as well. And then there's the question of transport, you know, um, of how best to, d to do whether it's distributed production. Um, or, or um, whether um, it's it's centralized, right? So the logistics of that are are very are very challenging for sure. So you could argue, for example, with natural gas. If you look at Alberta, maybe the opportunity there is that the natural gas gets uh, pumped to the coast, and they form blue hydrogen is then formed, uh, at, you know, at, at the port and then shipped from from there as an example, right? I'm not advocating for that, but I'm saying that there's many different scenarios that are that are possible. Hi, David, again, you, you mentioned that uh, wind and solar electricity are now far cheaper than fossil fuel sources. So I'm just curious, why is it that if you look at the levelized cost of electricity in countries that have made a huge commitment to wind and solar, domestic electricity costs correlate directly with the degree to which they have bought into wind and solar. By the way, I'm not arguing for fossil fuels. Yeah. I'm just challenging some of the assumptions that seem to go into some of these calculations. Because once you start adding the necessity for battery storage and a whole variety of adjustments to the grid, the costs go up. And the costs rise faster than the degree of penetration. Mm -hmm. So the more wind and solar electricity, the higher the costs. Right. Uh, secondly, China, which you know controls the solar panel market and has the largest installation, is committing to building massive amounts of coal power because they realize it's necessary for energy security and to stabilize the grid fluctuations and so on because of the inherent liability. So I'm just wondering, how did these things all... Yeah, come together. Well, maybe I'll answer this if I can. Um, second question. So that you know, that always comes up in discussions. Like, if how can China be um, a country that's implementing the most renewables, but is increasing coal production? Right. Um, if we look at Germany. Right. They resurrected their coal pr coal producing plants, coal power plants. Um, it's managing the transition, I think, is, is, a, is like a, a, you know, it's kind of a seesaw effect, right? It's they're trying to manage that gap in energy with other things, but it's not their long-term plan to stay there, neither for China either, right? They, they would prefer to shut down uh, the coal plants. They're creating a lot of, lot of issues, the health issues. They're uh, creating, um, you know, uh, social problems. 
Um, so it's not the long-term direction, but they're continuing to ramp up their renewables and looking at, at just how, how to manage the overall energy requirement. So all it's doing is filling a gap at the moment. The first question you had um, coming back, maybe you could just repeat that. Well, it was just that the more countries or states in the United yeah. States commit to wind and solar, the higher their domestic electricity costs even though we keep hearing that they should be going steadily downward. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think I would have to look at the specifics um, of, of that. Um, I think it, if there isn't storage, right, then, you, then your capacity factor is a lot lower than it should be. Um, and that's gonna contribute to cost. So that's one, I think one major issue, right? If you're only operating a fraction of the time you should be. Um, this is a, a, a assumption and maybe some of those cost numbers is that we're looking at you know much higher higher usage um, of of those renewables, like higher capacity factors are used 80% of the time instead of 30% of the time, right? Um, then there's individual specifics of each jurisdiction too, labor cost, uh, how they've amortized the cost of building that. So, um, yeah, I think we'd have to get into the nitty gritty of, of, the, uh, of the economics, but it's a good question, right? Like, will, will we see the cost of electricity come down in, in time a lot like that? So, um, yeah. Sorry, I don't have a No, I'm sorry. If, Bill. Yeah, go right ahead. So all of the technologies you're talking about, including wind and, and solar panels and towers and so on, are still produced using fossil fuel. And in fact, one could argue that a renewable energy technology is not really viable unless it had produces enough electricity to produce itself from mine site to installation plus enough surplus to power society and every analysis i've seen says that right now the only source that can do that is fossil fuel uh, wind power you, we're not building wind and solar panels using solar and wind electricity plus the surplus to power everything else so, so again i'm I'm just curious to know where you sit on that kind of issue. Well, I think um, where the boundaries are, are drawn um, around these approaches, oh, sorry, um, I think where the boundaries are uh, drawn around these different approaches is very important. And then very important to do the life cycle analysis um, uh, as well. So, uh, you know, more and more of that, that is being done, but um, it's, um, I agree with you that you, eventually you have to show that the life cycle for that particular approach has a real has a real benefit. Um, we are in the transition right now, so that that makes it a little more challenging because there's a lot of moving moving parts. But once you get to a more more of an equilibrium, hopefully we'll have a much more accurate. Uh, um, understanding of where we actually are at with that. So some some things are forecasted, right? Um, some are based on where we are now. Um, but um, really, to to see the full picture, we have we have to do the full life cycle analysis of that. Any more online questions? There are a couple. Yes. Okay. So I have one from Jess Brewer. Um, I note that nuclear power is barely mentioned. Have you projected uh, Have you projected the reduced cost of new small modular reactor designs when factories start mass producing them and the misguided LALRA regulations that are revisited with actual data on the biological effects of radiation? <laughs> well, I, I think. I'm not sure I can answer uh, that all, all of that question, but I am. I think um, what people see, uh, I mean, people either uh, 
totally embrace the uh, the small modular nuclear reactors, or they are, are totally against it, right? And cost comes up all, all the time. It's more expensive than other other forms of uh, energy that could could be uh, installed. Um, there have have been studies that have been done by General Electric and some you know major Siemens and other major companies that if you're if you're producing those small nuclear reactors on a assembly line approach, again at scale, um, the cost will come down considerably. Um, but then other other costs um, are, are are a problem with siting, regulation, all that sort of thing. That that requires um, you know that's increased cost of implementing nuclear power as well. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure about the the, the regulation part of it, uh, but from a technology point of view, it's much safer than the larger, more centralized systems that, that have had the issues in the past. And those are also old systems too, that are like 40 years old, right? So a lot's happened in that 40 years. So I really think that there has to be a proper consideration, uh, like the question's asking. Um, of, of where that stands today. Canada seems to, because of its background, um, seems to um, have some leaning towards uh, implementing that. But what I've heard that is that that might be used to be implemented, for example, in upstream processing in the oil sands, right? But that's not, that's not, <laughs> it's not helping the problem, right? So it's a really contradictory uh, type of goal to have in, have in mind. But I think Canada could could definitely play a role there, and um, I think it does need to be given a fair a fair assessment as as well, which I don't I don't think it has. I don't think people have kept pace with the, what's been happening in that industry. I have another one from Allison Rice. Um, I'm curious about what is known about the long term potential downsides of carbon capture and storage. Question. The, the long-term downside. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of that question is about leakage. Um, if you don't have good containment, um, then that that's a problem. Um, if you have large uh, storage in in any kind of carbon sink, if the conditions are such that uh, it gets re-emitted into the uh, the atmosphere, it's going to create create an issue that, uh, that's, a, that's a big concern. Climate change with increasing surface temperatures um, is, um, is, is, is a potential problem, right? Because that, that means we might have more release of carbon sinks where before they, they were stable. We can think of, you know, um, the north, for example, with the very rapid significant increase in temperature there or uh, methyl hydrates in the ocean, right, that are only exist under a, a very limited set of conditions. So we could, and, and also um, carbon sinks that we, we use uh, now, right, uh, whether it's for, uh, you know, oil enhanced recovery or whatever, um, those could contribute significantly if, if those leakages happen before the CO2 is, is basically um, chemi chemically rendered useless or less harmful, right? Yes. Thanks. Um, is there any prediction for um, until what year it will take until the transition to renewable energy? Like how much more damage needs to be done to an environment to reach a closed loop cycle for our resources and energy? I'm, I'm trying to understand your question, because if we look at renewables today for the total energy portfolio, they only count for you know a small percentage, less than 10%, right? But the growth in, for example, solar and wind is very, is very significant. It's growing very quickly, right? So your question is, will that growth level off or? Like in order to transition to renewable energy, resources need to be extracted from the land. 
like, right? Until what point of extracting from the natural environment would it take? Like, is there any study done? Like, uh, yeah, yes, there is study for sure. Um, that's the type of McKelvey diagram that was shown, which kind of shows resources and reserves and um, what the potential is for, for mining some of those, those critical minerals and key resource areas. Uh, so those studies are, are, are being done. I think the biggest issue is that how we get to a point where we get some stability in what we need for a constant value and then recycling becomes, becomes most important, right? We have to be able to recycle at a very high recovery rate all these critical minerals and all that. We can't continue just to um, re remove them, right? Recycle becomes very important. But getting to that point where we have a sufficient amount of that resource, I think is, is the challenge at the moment. But then recycling will be, um, and should be done in parallel, is becoming very important as well. So for example, in the lithium case, I showed you that's um, that's a really important aspect now of that whole area. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for your questions, and particularly thank you, David, for your talk. I, I'm just amazed at how widely you could spread yourself, and admire particularly what you called your agnostic approach to things. Thank you for all of your wisdom and, uh, and for your interest in the subject. So thank you very much again.